primary aim of Project Moho, the, the word Moho came from the uh, Moho Ravichik discontinuity, which was, uh, we were attempting to drill down to that, which would reach the Earth's Just mantle. Just above the mantle, yeah. And there were only, a, and it was closest to the surface in ocean regions. Of course, it would have been much easier to drill from land, but uh, it was so deep uh, in land that it they felt like it wasn't really practical, so there were several sites that were under consideration uh, to go offshore uh, for drilling. So we were doing the uh, design schemes for the uh, equipment to drill. We were select, uh, site selection had not been finalized, but it was going to be between the. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico, little, little offshore Puerto Rico, and uh, a place off of Hawaii, you know, off, off of Maui. And was it, it like determined. 14,000 feet of water uh, or something? The water like? depth would have been anywhere from 10 to 15,000 feet, I think. Yeah. Okay. And the total drilling depth was to be 35,000 feet from the ocean floor to the, to the uh, mantle. Yeah. So, uh, we had designed the, uh, the drilling vessel, which was one of the first semi-submersibles, yeah. and uh, Alan McClure was involved in that. Yeah. And uh, my responsibility on that were the tubular goods, primarily the uh, drill string and the riser casing, uh -huh. and also uh, we provided consulting services to some of the other departments because we had a corrosion engineer and uh, a metallurgist, so we, we assisted other departments in their areas, but mm -hmm. primarily it was the uh, tubular goods and the handling, the pipe, pipe racking and pipe handling system aboard ship. So uh, I'd say we were spent most of the time in an analysis of the drill string for the uh, total depth from the attachment to the vessel to the bottom of the hole eventually. Uh, how to achieve cores, retrieve them, and uh, in order to return the drilling mud, uh, we had an external riser around the drill pipe, and that was uh, would continually circulate mud through that. And because of the depth of the riser, uh, we had to put buoys every so often to help support Boy, keep them the weight of it. Yeah. And, and, uh, these were, uh, we did some research on that and finally determined that uh, syntactic foam buoys would be the best because the deeper ones could withstand the pressure. And they, uh, they were efficient, so those had been designed. Uh, most of the design was pretty far along before the plug was pulled on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, my responsibility primarily was in the design and the uh, specification for the uh, drill string and the riser, the materials. We did uh, <laughs> testing, fatigue testing. There was a lot of fatigue testing on the material. We did some basic research in, in uh, fatigue testing, both at uh, Southwest Research Institute and at uh, Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And we had designed and were in the process of uh, starting to build a full-scale <coughs> fatigue testing machine for uh, production line drill pipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was going to be built out at Rice University, but before, before we got started on it, well, that, yeah. was, that was the end of the project. What was the deepest that a, a, a drill ship or semi-submersible had drilled up to that point? I mean, 14,000 feet was a huge leap. Yes, it was, and this, of course, required dynamic positioning. And uh, we had designed, or I say we, that, that was not part of my purview. This yeah. was another department, but they did design the dynamic positioning, and that was well underway, too. Yeah. But, uh, I know um, Shell and others were, were working with the CUS, CUS, CUS one, one, yes. on uh -huh. you know, Deploying dynamic positioning right. at about the same time. Yes, the dynamic positioning concept was not new. It had yeah. been had been used, but the uh, we were going to have to stay on station for several years, yeah. and uh, so this 
introduce problems of maintenance and repair on the on the uh, positioning system and on the uh, being able to take the uh, the actual propulsion motors and being able to retrieve them, overhaul, repair, and replace them, and so forth. So, huh. quite a bit of effort. So, is, did that. any of the design work you did on the Mohol um, did that contribute to uh, deep water riser and and drill drilling technology after that? Well, we like to think that it did. They were uh, we published uh, a final report, mm -hmm. which was several volumes when it was all through and basically provided all the information that uh, and uh, sources and references and so forth so that it was available to the industry. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, the biggest part of the work I was involved in uh, immediately after that and for several years was in providing engineering services to our marine division. I was in Brown and Ruth's uh, engineering department, just general engineering which included pulp and paper and in all kinds of uh, disciplines, but after a few years, uh, since we were concentrating on support of the marine uh, equipment di uh, division, uh, which was we had different divisions and uh, European and Gulf of Mexico and Southeast Asia and so forth, uh, since I was working with them so closely, finally took our engineering group and just transferred it to the marine department, and then uh, so from there. Uh, we had the naval architecture and we were responsible for the design then of the new offshore construction equipment mm -hmm. and uh, pipe laying, pipe laying analysis and all this type of thing. Hmm. I, I was asked uh, in preparation for this, I was asked if I could recall any humorous incidents. Yeah. And uh, I, I couldn't really think of too many laughs along the way. but. Uh, <laughs> There was one that my wife reminded me of. I was uh, working offshore on a pipe lay barge off the Louisiana coast. And uh, being the clutch I am, I managed to sprain my ankle. And uh, I went, went, got my rack, was going to spend the night there, but it, overnight it got quite swollen. So the decision was that I should go in and see a doctor. I had a f friend that was uh, working in, the, in a survey department who had a car on the dock uh, and we managed to lower me into a boat and got to the, got to the dock, got in the car, we driving up to Bell Chase where our uh, right. operations were. And on the way we passed through a little town called Port Sulphur and uh, the driver uh, my friend Bob Bro, who was driving the car, uh, we came through the town and there was a red light and uh, it changed to green and the car in front of us was going to turn left. And Bob was impatient. He looked, didn't see anybody on the right, nobody in the rearview mirror, so he pulled around to the right and, and went on. Uh, we weren't too far down the road before police pulled us over and the local sheriff. Uh, was telling us that we'd uh, violated the law by passing on the right. And I was so agreeing. Bob says, uh, what's the deal? And this sheriff, I don't know if you recall, back in those days there were uh, Dodge Automobiles had a commercial with a local sheriff in it who uh, was kind of rough talking and so forth. And uh, and Bob said, well, what's the deal? The sheriff said, ain't no deal, boy. You're coming to jail. So they. We followed them down to the uh, jailhouse in Port Sulphur, and there would be a court hearing. Uh, the this was on a Saturday, I guess, uh, but it would be the following week. And in the meantime, they wanted a two hundred dollar cash bond. Well, between us, Bob and I didn't have two hundred dollars cash, and uh, credit cards, all that. They didn't take no over checks or anything. So since we didn't have any, uh, didn't have enough money to post the bond. Bob spent the night in jail, and uh, I called the Bell Chase office and caught somebody come down drive, pick me up, and take me back to uh, to the hospital. So I spent the night in the hospital. He spent the night in jail. <laughs> Passing on the right. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be careful down there in South Louisiana. Yes, sir. <laughs> it, it was fun. Though.